Good morning, Mets fans, and welcome to a Wednesday edition of Driving with Mr. Met. I am Mr. Met, and uh, despite saying I would be here yesterday to talk uh, about a baseball game, that didn't happen because Monday's game got rained out. Um, it pushed Jacob deGrom back another day. Uh, he was, of course, set to start on Sunday. He was then pushed in favor of uh, the spot starter, Corey Oswalt, uh, because of the weather. And uh, look, he ended up getting to pitch anyway on Monday, so he ended up with two extra days uh, in between starts. Didn't affect Jacob at all, and it obviously didn't affect the Mets either because they didn't score any runs for him, not till late at least. But it was too little too late as the Mets fell to the Marlins last night. I want to talk about the game. I want to talk about DeGrom and his continued performance of excellence this year. And uh, I want to talk about today's double dip on today's show. The uh, good news about Monday's rainout is that uh, we get to make up that game today. Mets get a double header um, starting at four uh, with game one, and game two will be like 20 minutes after or whatever, something like that. So, um, on the mound today for the Mets, uh, Zach Wheeler and Jacob Vargas will be the starters for both games, and we'll just have to hope that Wheeler can go deep because Vargas, as we know, is a huge question mark. He might be fine, he might also be garbage, so we'll see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to Zach Wheeler uh, getting what might be his team leading uh, 11th, uh, a team, team lead tying 11th win. I think Noah Syndergaard also has 11. Uh, wins on the season. Um, but speaking of wins or the lack thereof, let's talk about Jacob deGrom. Last night, um, he, of course, uh, not only didn't get a win, but he got a loss. <laughs> Jacob got a loss last night. He's now below 500 on the season at 8-9, and nine, which is just absurd considering how well he's pitched. And considering that he now stands alone atop the leaderboard of a statistic that is insane, 26 consecutive starts, allowing three runs or fewer, or three runs or less. Um, he was tied with uh, some King Cole fella who died like 100 years ago um, for the better part of the last uh, week since his last start. Uh, but of course, last night, Jake being Jake, um, once again, allowed fewer than three runs, and he's now the now holds a major league record for uh, the most dominant stretch, one of the most dominant stretches as a pitcher in baseball history, in my opinion. And the damnable misery of it all is that the Mets can't score when Jake's on the mound. You know, it was funny because I think Gary or Ron said it on the broadcast last night, <clears throat> said something like, dude, um, Jake was supposed to start Sunday, and what did the Mets do? They scored six runs on Sunday. He starts tonight, they can't score for Eddie's can't score anything. So, you know, it's just Jake's dumb luck and and misfortune or bad fortune or whatever you want to call it. But the Mets just don't score when DeGrum's on the mound. And I think at the end of the day, we're gonna learn and we're gonna find out that the team has been pressing really hard to support DeGrom in every way possible. And I, that's the reason, in my, again, in my opinion, that, that they're not scoring when Jake's on the mound. It's the honestly, it's the only thing that makes sense. Because there's no rhyme or reason as to why they can score runs four, eight, four days of the week. And then on the fifth day, when DeGrom's on the hill, they forget how to score. Like, it, it doesn't make sense. So I'm, I'm, leaning on, uh, I'm leaning on that they're pressing and that that's why they don't score for Jake. But it doesn't matter. Uh, like I said, Jake gets a loss last night. He drops below 500 on the season. As far as his record goes, uh, his ERA skyrocketed to 1.71, up from 1.68. Um, but he still has a half a run lead over his next closest competitor. Um, he is coming awfully close to uh, the strikeout, um, uh, to his uh, career strikeout record. Sorry. Uh, I believe I read that he tied his uh, career record for strikeouts last night. And at like 239, I want to say. I don't know, maybe I'm making that number up, but whatever. He will clearly set his record for most strikeouts in a season um, by himself, uh, for himself rather, um, in his next start because it's just what Jake does. So, 
Uh, the other thing I read was that he has the most strikeouts among uh, two seasons back to back uh, since Doc Gooden in 1984, 1985. Now Doc has him by, I think, over 100 strikeouts. I, I, the number that comes in my mind is 577 for Doc between the two seasons, and Jake isn't even at 500. But still, I mean, that's that's it's impressive. What what he's been doing, what Degrom has been doing, is nothing short of impressive. And the run support's not there. And I, I do think that the voters are going to acknowledge the historic season that Jake has had. And Gary, you know, Gary Cohen and, and, and even Howie Rose last night, I was listening to someone on the, in, in, on the radio last night, and even Howie said the same sort of thing. Like, look, the voters for Cy Young have to take into consideration that this guy hasn't had uh, more than a handful of innings this season where he hasn't been pitching under duress, by which they mean he's either protecting a one-run lead or protecting a tie game or is trailing by a very small margin like one run. He's Jake has always been pitching in what we would call like high leverage, high pressure situations, and it, it doesn't affect him. I mean, he hasn't had a laugh for all season I, that I can recall. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm blocking it out or something, but... Um, you know, I, I think the, the voters uh, are, are, are going to be, a, I'm hoping, going to be a little bit more progressive this year. Start looking at the fact that the win is the most antiquated and ridiculous stat by which to judge a pitcher's performance. And they're going to start looking at things like innings pitched, quality starts, um, the ERA, and paying close, really close attention to those things. And forgetting about the fact that, that the win um, and, and the record being below 500, which again, I just think is crazy. Uh, but forgetting about that, that, that those, those things are team statistics. They are not a, an individual's statistic. So I'm hoping that that ends up being the case. And I'm hoping that Jacob deGrom over his last, um, I guess three starts now, uh, that he's going to have, um, will, uh, be acknowledged for the wonderful work that he's done this season with the Cy Young Award. Uh, I do have to mention really quickly that um, <laughs> uh, I was so excited at first when they decided they were going to push Jake from uh, Sunday to Monday because I'm going uh, with the seven line this weekend to Boston and that would have lined Jake up to pitch on Saturday for the seven line Army's largest outing uh, ever. Uh, 1,609 seven line Army members will be in attendance in Boston. And on Monday, I, I was, uh, you know, it's Sunday rather, and into into Monday morning, I was elated. You know, I'm thinking like, hey, this is great. We're going to get to see Jake. And then they rained it out Monday, and I was like, oh, no Jake. Maybe we'll see Corey Oswalt or something. Um, uh, it can't be worse than our outing in Milwaukee two years ago when we got to see um, uh, Logan Verrett get the spot start. That was fantastic. So. And in any event, I will be in Boston to see the Mets this weekend. It'll be fun. Uh, I've never been to Fenway before, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, before I wrap it up for today, I just want to comment on Michael Conforto really quickly. Um, Conforto provided the majority of the Mets' offense last night, very much like he did uh, on Sunday against the Phillies, where he had four RBIs. Um, Conforto has really come around in these last several weeks, um, lining himself up in the ranks with... Ahmed Rosario and Jeff McNeil uh, and Brandon Nimmo, who's been having a nice little streak of late. Um, the, again, positive signs pointing toward 2019 uh, with these guys who honestly, and for all of the people that are hating on this idea, these guys weren't going to be traded or let go anyway. You're not going to get rid of Michael Conforto. You're not going to get rid of Brandon Nimmo. You're not going to get rid of Rosario. You're certainly not going to get rid of McNeil. So the, the notion that oh, well, the Mets are just shoving these losers down their throats even though there are better options out there. Uh, I don't buy that. And um, I I'm feeling more and more encouraged by the way Michael Conforto is swinging the bat, particularly last night when he hit the ball out of the park to right center field. Um, that's his, and you heard Keith say it, that's his natural swing. He is so strong. He doesn't have to overswing. He doesn't have to swing in front of the ball. He can let the ball come to him. He can drive the ball to all fields. That's the key for Conforto going forward. And I hope that he's something has clicked and he remembered, hey, this is this is what got me to the dance. You know, I need to go back to this. Uh, the home runs will come because again, he's he's strong enough to hit home runs to all fields. So uh, we'll see if Michael can continue this hot stretch as the season dwindles down. 
Uh, and speaking of dwindling down, this episode is dwindling down. That'll be it for today. Uh, I thank you for uh, for watching. I will be back tomorrow to recap both of today's games. Um, unless they're both rained out. Who knows? Uh, hopefully not. <laughs> but uh, I'll be back tomorrow to talk about uh, uh, how Wheeler did and how Vargas did. So until then, thanks for watching. Follow me on Twitter at Mr. Underscore Met. And as always, let's go Mets.